Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You've reached the No Name Cinema Society, the film review show that digs just a little bit deeper. It is a very special Wednesday episode before Thanksgiving here, November 24th, 2021. Kick off our 67th series of episodes. And as always, we start a series of episodes with a review of a current feature. And tonight, it's the franchise reboot, Ghostbusters Afterlife. Hi, everybody. My name is Jonathan Betzlin, one of your hosts here this evening, here at my home in Los Angeles. I got... Uh, Luke behind me, he had a franchise of his own not too long ago, or maybe a long time ago. Either way, uh, I got some other great co-hosts with me. Uh, first, ladies and gentlemen, a seismologist and composer who moved to Los Angeles to investigate earthquakes as well as the music scene. Patrick Taylor is here. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. He gives you a double hello, audience. Also, a young nerd coming to terms with his family's mysterious past. Ryan Turner's back. What's up? Ryan's often our relief pitcher who comes in when, uh, when when somebody can't do it. He saves us at the last minute. So, Ryan, thank you for participating tonight. And Patrick and I actually saw this movie together. And, Patrick, here's a picture of all of us. And not only is it us, but other society members as well. Kelly and Devin. It's the rare occasion of having four society members in one place. I had a good time. And there's your new wife as well, Alex. Yes, yes. Uh, JB has friends. You know, it's true. They're not just people on the screen. They're real people. <laughs> He said we were friends, Ryan. Is that nice? I think it's accurate. Oh, that, very good. Very good. Um, here is the schedule for this, what is going to be our 67th series of episodes, of course, starting tonight with our review of Ghostbusters Afterlife. This upcoming Monday, our first post-Thanksgiving show will be our indie spotlight. Where we're going to do Captain Fantastic from 2016. And we're back Thursdays. Next week, Thursday, December 2nd, will be our classic movie discussion of the film Earth Girls Are Easy from 1988. And on Monday, December the 6th, will be our 51st sound off, in which Zach and Devin will join me. Zach's going to take over the Below the Line segment. We're going to open up the obscure movie vault and do a review of a more obscure your film and i'm going to count down my top five sci-fi comedies of all time based on a review of earth girls are easy and we might have a surprise coming up for you in the society and we'll announce that on the sound off on december 6th all right guys now the question is who is drinking with me i've got my i think it's my usual lately a legion space dust ipa uh when we went to see the movie of Patrick, you had a few drinks so uh, are you drinking with me tonight no, I am sober today. You know, I, I'm, I'm an old man. You know, I got to slow down, I guess. Oh, I see. Yeah. The movie night was this night. Ryan, you drinking anything with me? I'm having a Red Bull. We're going to pretend that there's vodka in it. Here is the <laughs> drinking game slide, which features things that you guys sent in, things that you drink to when we do them on the show. Anytime I say contrivance, contrive, or similitude, or all time. And anytime Patrick doesn't know the name of an actor or a movie, those of us that are drinking are, might have a hard time tonight, Patrick. I, I think so, because I don't have my cheat sheet in front of me. Let's go. <laughs> Cheers to those of you that are drinking with me in the audience. Hopefully we don't get too drunk. Are you guys ready for the summary? So ready. Jumping right into it. Ghostbusters Afterlife. Corey discovers the father she never knew passed away and left her a small farm in Oklahoma. Since she's broke, she moves her and her two kids, Trevor and young scientist Phoebe, to the Midwest where the kids uncover that their grandfather was the one and only Egon Spangler of the world famous Ghostbusters. And he was in Oklahoma to prevent the next apocalypse. Work that the kids must now take up on their own. Now it's time for opening thoughts. Now Patrick and I saw the movie together and we, we weren't supposed to talk about it, but as he's on his way out, he had some things to say. Uh, uh, so uh, I have a sense of where he is with the movie. So I'm gonna let him start. Patrick, one sentence or less. How'd you feel about Ghostbusters Afterlife? Really fun adventure movie. Really fun. Excellent opening thought. Brief. I love it. Ryan. It was fine. And uh, yeah, it was fine. It's two sentences, but it was the same sentence twice. So I'm going to count it. As a <laughs> second time was more impactful, I think. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, for my opening thought is uh, I thought it was a great movie made with love and reverence. So it looks like uh, Patrick and I maybe enjoyed it a little more. I almost enjoyed it the most. And, and here's why I, we always like to start with the element of the film that worked the best. And I'm going to start with direction, uh, specifically shot selection. I, I've been critical of some of Jason Reitman's other films, but I've praised some as well. Some great ones, some not so great ones. But it's hard to argue, especially based on his shot choices, that he's a natural cinematic storyteller. You always feel like he's in control, like you're in good hands being guided by him. Through his shots, he manages to carefully play with expectations, both for hardcore fans and for newcomers. In that sense, the film almost owed more to Spielberg than his own father in the way he orchestrated reveals and the unveiling of information. 
subtle hints along the way and near misses, like when Trevor uncovers the Ghostbusters logo but doesn't see it exactly, but the audience does, or when they're looking for the ghost munch but don't see all the bites he's taken out of stop signs and other objects as they pass them. All that kind of stuff is right out of the Spielberg playbook. I grant you it is manipulative but hides the puppet strings better than most, which most modern directors are very bad at. The other thing I was impressed with directorially was tone. There was a lot more heart in this film than in the original series, I think. There was a tongue-in-cheek approach to the first two films, largely due to Bill Murray's brilliant, sarcastic creation of Peter Venkman. He dominated the sense of humor in those films. Here, while there is humor, it's a little more organic, not better or funnier, just more embedded in character. Phoebe's series of terrible science jokes, for example. But the abandoned family storyline gave the film real emotional depth and raised the stakes, as far as I'm concerned. And all of it played without adversely affecting the other. The heart and the comedy and the action all interwove neatly, just like cross streams from the Proton Packs. Part and parcel with this, the performances all fell in line with this difficult tonal balance, I think. Most notably, the kids all seem to understand that tricky sandbox and fit naturally into the world that Reitman created. Patrick has often talked about the challenges of working with kids. Add to that this unique tone, and I think that speaks to really strong direction in this case. I'll speak to the individual performances shortly, but I wanted to call them out on mass since I was talking about direction and tone. Ryan, what do you think? It was safe, did what it needed to do. It reminded me a lot of like The Force Awakens in terms of what he was doing, because it's like a soft reboot of a brand new series of new characters and played on nostalgia. It didn't really venture too far out of the formula. In terms of the way he was directing it, I thought his shot selection was really nice. A lot of the reveals, the cinematography was really cool. And the way that he had that humor throughout, I think did work. And he was really leaning into the nostalgia, which I think, you know, fans, super fans of the series would really enjoy. He was successful, but it, it wasn't anything that I'm like jumping up and down to see again or continue. Like it was kind of like, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, a couple things. I mean, one, I sort of bristled at the Force Awakens comparison, but because for me, the Force Awakens was very bad, at least script wise. I also think J.J. Abrams is a bad director personally, but I, I think a big difference is Ghostbusters as a franchise was always winking towards the audience. It never took itself too seriously, whereas the Star Wars films, and this is some of the things that fans love about it, take themselves very seriously about canon and all those other things. A little bit of a lighter approach to Ghostbusters in general, but I also think the acting was better in terms of these new characters. Some of it was a little more grounded to me. In terms of it just being fine, before we get to Patrick, because I don't want to forget, was there something about the direction that made it just fine? Or what could he have done or should he have done differently in terms of some of those choices? I mean, the reason I said Force Awakens is because structurally it really follows a lot of the same beats of the original one that was so successful. You could take the Slimer to the Muncher in the State Puff Marshmallows like coming back. They could have gone into completely new territories with completely new ghosts, but they, they kind of relied on going back to similar but adjacent kind of ideas. I wouldn't say it was in the direction that I had any necessary problems. I think it was in the writing. Yeah, that, that sounds I, like that a I script kinda... thing. My counter argument to that, a lot of the iconography was revisited, but I mean, I felt in terms of these, these characters and their origin story, there is something sort of new and fresh about this family dynamic. That was not in the original. I also feel like this one had a lot more heart. This family story at the center of it was very different. That was the big departure for me from the original and the tone of the original. Patrick, I know I've avoided you for a little bit because I got into the weeds with Ryan. What do you think about all that I said and he said? I think the direction, especially uh, in terms of the, the camera uh, in, during the chase scenes and the action was, was superb. Some of the direction problems for me was in how hard you, you pushed the the emotion out of the lead child actress, um, which everyone should drink because I can't remember her name. But right, I um, you heard but, it. but her name is McKenna Grace. McKenna, I think I think they pushed her a little too hard, a little bit to, to be too dramatic, and and that 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 went to the camera, like JB's saying. Everyone around her was great, even the the, the sidekick. And so I think the direction was great. I think working with children is tough. The chase through the the town that was superb, and it was action like like you want from a Ghostbuster. The first two films don't really have that. Do you see my reference to Spielberg there? It feels yes, more like Spielberg yes. than Reitman. I would agree. Maybe I'm not thinking about it right because I haven't seen the Ghostbusters in so long. So I love the original Ghostbusters. I feel like there's a difference. The action scenes were a little crisper because there was always like a tongue-in-cheek element to the original. No complaint about the original. It's perfect for what it is. It's a great action comedy. It sounded like you object to the heart element that I admired about it. You felt it was a little pushed. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but am I understanding that correctly? No, no, just the direction of the talent. There was a scene where she's supposed to be crying where it obviously looked like they just dropped a tear on her cheek i didn't believe that that 
that acting choice by this young girl. So I'm giving her a little bit of grace. That's the director pushing her to go in that direction. I disagree with you about McKenna Grace in this instance, but I'll get to that in performances. Ryan, I think, wants to open the uh, can of worms on the screenplay. I actually like the script a lot. I think the screenplay did a great job of filling in the gap of the years that passed realistically, organically, and mostly not all at once. It peeled it away like an onion, except for one unfortunately over expositional phone call scene. Aside from that, uncovering the mysteries of the past was enthralling for me and the emotional content well earned. Screenplay wise, I also want to call out the characterizations. I found the new characters fun, interesting, detailed with dimension and depth. Overall, I was just really impressed with the alchemy of it, merging old and new somewhat seamlessly. Things that you thought was following a formula it was more like iconography. There's a reason for it. Like they justified it with the story. A lot of that same iconography would apply. But I agree if, if you're comparing Muncher to Slimer, they were a little too close for my liking. I think it's really hard to sort of make something new, but at the same time, keep a lot of the old flavor. I I, I liked how they, they balanced that, but it sounds like you were a little uncomfortable with it. I wouldn't say uncomfortable. I just feel like I wasn't jumping up and down. I think that the strongest part, which we can get to when we talk, is the performances. I think the actors really did a lot with what they're given. I think the fact that they had like a character named Podcast is pretty silly. I like the idea of that character and the actor slayed it. But I think he slayed it in spite of the writing, not necessarily because of the writing. It was really catering to exactly that same sort of demographic that loved the original Ghostbusters. And I think anyone that loved the original Ghostbusters would watch this and absolutely love it. And I've been pretty detached away from the original Ghostbusters. I haven't watched a long, in a long time. So I kind of came into this from the outside a little bit. It really relied on you having watched the previous one to really fully enjoy the experience of this one. And it's true because Patrick brought his wife and I was concerned that she was going to get lost because she had not seen the original. He was trying to refresh her before the movie. He was showing her some videos, you know, uh, right before we went in. I didn't think there'd be as many references as there was, quite mm -hmm. frankly. But I think, like you're saying, there's some sloppy exit position. I think a lot of the story math is pretty sloppy, too. It was a really good use of, like, the question tool, meaning, like, having a compelling question that we want to kind of unravel of the grandfather and what brought him here and what he's kind of uncovering. But I would say the answer is just a quick brush across of being like, yeah, just accept all these things. The more you think about it, the more it just kind of falls apart. It's a very... House of Cards explanation. The plot, in my opinion, of what was going on in this town and all the details is pretty sloppy. I disagree with you about the plot. And I'm usually pretty sensitive, as you know, about contrivance and, and things like that. I think that it was, uh, I bought it. Like, especially because a lot of it, amazingly, is in the first film. Like, they took a lot of, like, strands from the original and made sense out of them, like the Evo Shandor character. He is referenced in the first film, so it was nice to see that revisited. Within the Ghostbusters world, I bought it. It all made sense to me in terms of Egon's reason for going to Oklahoma and a lot of those other details. The one phone call scene that I referenced, I wish that was written differently. And I don't think all the information that was given in that scene was necessary. But Ryan and I have argued a little bit about screenplay, Patrick. You're the tiebreaker. I think the pillars of the screenplay were there. Like I enjoyed the, the setup, the problem that they made, and then how they resolved it in a very warm way. The only couple of problems I had were there wasn't any real training sequence. These kids kind of knew how to use this stuff very, very quickly, knew how to use a drone, knew how to use all types of specialized equipment very, very quickly. At least like let time pass where, they, where you think that they're practicing. I thought that, but then I let it quickly pass because A, I was having so much fun yeah. and I sort of chalked it up to them being as smart as they are and sort of modern kids being a little more adept. Podcast kid technology. wasn't that smart. Podcast kid was in summer <laughs> school watching the movie. He wasn't that smart. But he was and, tech and, savvy. And, and, Didn't you get the impression that he was like tech savvy? Because all he did was operate a remote control truck. Making podcasts is not that hard, man. <laughs> like I wouldn't. <laughs> Case in point, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Come on, man. Like maybe if you like have remote control cars in the beginning, we would understand how this guy can drive this car. So but my other major problem was that I didn't really like the writing of how the mom and 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 the science teacher, the most sexy man in the world. Uh, came together. I didn't really like that. They are actually better actors and funnier people. And I think the writing didn't help them at all. Maybe it's a chemistry thing as well. I, you know, it's funny. Uh, I sat next to Patrick and uh, so he can, he can attest. I was laughing a lot. <laughs> I, he was I the was only like, person in the theater half the, time. <laughs> half the time. I was like, oh my God, Alex was like, well, I started, I laughed at him. I, I, he Alex, did laugh like, at you me. You were laughing so late. 
I was like, how is you, how are you the only person laughing at this line that- I was like, laughing like a lot. Was laughing at I, every joke. I was laughing a lot, especially at her bad jokes. I agree with you about the training element to some degree. Like I thought it and then moved past it. I bought it, but I like bought it by a hair. If they did more impressive things, but yes, I, I can see that. I didn't feel it. Once you're on board for the ride, I feel like you're on board for the ride. I was willing to go with it. Yeah, Brian, you can let it go. I found myself going like, man, this is not as tight as it could have been. It, it kind of made me go, oh, this is going to be a relatively forgettable movie for me. Yeah, no, I definitely feel differently. I actually love this movie. Is it that you just did not believe the things that happened? Did they seem implausible to you within the world created? There's a lot of things, if you think too much about it, it kind of just starts to fall apart. It was authentic to the original, and I think you, it relied on the nostalgia of the original. It played in the same sandbox. Yeah, sandbox, totally. But it, it worked within that world. I don't think it broke any of the rules of that world, but it did extend it a little bit with some of these new characters. The unraveling of the mystery was, to me, the best part. I forget the other screenwriter, but Jason Reitman is one of them. I do think that they did a better job of connecting it than they did in Force Awakens. Yeah. For me. I guess. All right, so I'm going to move on to performances. Patrick's been on my side mostly, but now I'm going to disagree with Patrick because I'm going to talk about some of the individual performances. And I'm going to start with McKenna Grace because I thought she was fabulous. It's almost unfair how good McKenna Grace has become at such a young age. I was first impressed with her in the below average Chris Evans movie Gifted from a few years ago. Then as a young Carol in Captain Marvel. Her Phoebe, I think, is a tremendous invention, carefully nuanced, extremely vivid. It's all the more impressive given all the other roles we've seen her in. It's not like Reitman cast her because she's like the character, like we often do when we cast kids. That's not the case here. She created this character from, from scratch. She disappears into Phoebe. Patrick's going to think I'm crazy. I think she carries this movie. I didn't mind any of her emotional elements. I thought they were earned. I thought they were honest. I really liked McKenna Grace. Patrick's already talked against her. Ryan Turner. I thought she was a star. I'm a big fan of her and have been since I first saw her. I, she's super talented and I think she's a big reason that this movie's as good as it is. I think her, what the other actor's name is, Logan the Kim. podcast. What's up? Logan Kim. Logan Kim. Logan Kim was incredible as podcast. I think the two of them made the movie. Obviously, Paul Red's solid. I don't feel like he was fully utilized to his fullest potential. I think gets his little improv bits in that are fun. But ultimately, he could have been used much better. He was funny and he's charming because he starts at funny and charming. Logan Kim, McKenna Grace, I think were the stars. Definitely talented enough to carry an entire franchise in the future, I think. There's three directions I, I kind of want to go in here. But the first thing, you have to admit, with the kids being as good as Eric, Jason Reitman has something to do with that. I haven't seen McKenna Grace be bad in anything she's in. Especially with this tricky tone that we've talked about. I mean, yes, Patrick didn't buy the emotion, but there's this there's this element of comedy, but there's this, there's this emotional element as well. Yes, she's talented, but I mean, like, I think it's a tightrope walk. And without a good director, especially for such a young actor, she would struggle a little bit more. You know, I mean, I think Jason Reitman plays a part in helping her through this. Yeah, hard to say, but I, yeah, whoever helped her, she did a great job. So I want to disagree with you about Paul Rudd, but I'm going to wait to give Patrick the chance to argue with us about McKenna Grace. No, my my uh, critique about McKenna was during our talk of direction. I think she did a really great job for what she was given. I only think that there was a couple of moments where it was too much, but uh, heck, heck if the director wasn't asking for too much, you know? And I, but I think she, she did a great job. I think she definitely melted into it and you could see how she was the granddaughter of this beloved character. Yeah, that's um, a great and point. So she was great. I'm going to bring it to Paul Rudd. I was going to save him for later because he was my my main complaint about the movie. Not that he was underused. I just feel like he was just Paul Rudd. He doesn't bring much more than he usually does. A strong combination of charm and comic timing, but not much beyond that. It might be exactly what the movie needed, maybe. But I do wonder what it would have been like if he were able to round out his character more. Not necessarily adding scenes, just playing them differently. It might have pulled focus from the main story, maybe. I don't know. But I also think it could have added emotional detail. I would have liked to have seen a little more detail from him as an actor in creating this character. Patrick? His and the mother's character didn't add enough for me. Their dialogue specifically, the way they gave their lines of awkward attraction, I didn't buy it. That banter between them, that's their job to get there. And they, they didn't quite do it. And it wasn't quite believable. And it wasn't funny like the kids were funnier when paul rudd's on the film on screen you're supposed to kill it because you're paul rudd you got to be the charming guy on screen and that's his job he wasn't quite as funny just out of curiosity your main complaint about this movie is it wasn't funny enough is that what my understanding yeah the action was dope the warmth was great the nostalgia was dope 
you wanted the movie to be funnier. To me, it was just the right amount of funny. Like, I wanted him to be Billy Crystal. Part. What scene did he steal? I don't think he stole anything. Yeah, I don't think he's good. Obviously, I'm the one who started that, but I didn't want him to steal scenes either. I feel like that would have pulled focus. I actually wanted more depth of his character, more backstory, more of a character and less Paul Rudd. Ryan, you start out talking about liking Paul Rudd. I feel like I've opened a can of worms with Patrick here about it. I don't think he was utilized to the level that he could have been. I really do think it is in the writing. I kind of agree with Patrick. I personally didn't think it was as funny as it could have been or nearly as funny as the original. You would hope that someone like Paul Rudd would bring a lot to that, but it felt like a lot of like swings and misses. The disconnect it sounds like to me guys is, is this desire for it to be funnier than it was, I don't think that was ever the intention. I don't think it wanted the laugh out line lines. What made the original funny is Bill Murray, is Peter Venkman. Like Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis in the original are basically straight men, and even Ernie Hudson. It's all Bill Murray and his sarcastic approach. They made a conscious choice not to try and recreate that sense of humor. It didn't have a place here. I don't think it was intended to be like a full on comedy. I think it wanted to be a more action-y kind of thing that Patrick responded to. But I don't think it was trying to match the same kind of tongue-in-cheek humor. I think it was by casting Paul Rudd. And earlier, everyone has to drink. I said Billy Crystal instead of Bill Murray. But oh, you wanted no. Paul Rudd. I was confused <laughs> by the Billy Crystal. Exactly, thing, exactly. But... Everyone has to drink. You want Bill Murray. You want Paul Rudd to be Bill Murray. You want him to be the, the funny straight man who who's just dry and you don't know what's going to come out of his mouth. I did wasn't. not want that. I did not want that. And I'm glad I didn't get it. So it seems like that's the disconnect. So I, I do have one more performance. I was very pleased to see this actress in the film. I named her as, uh, as the best supporting actress of 2014 for her work in Gone Girl. And I continue to be flabbergasted about how Carrie Coon manages to transform herself so thoroughly from role to role. She is so different here than in Gone Girl or my number one film of 2018, Widows or Fargo, or Infinity War, of course. Furthermore, Carrie's mother character is not your typical oblivious mom role. She has demons to work through, and not just the kind that the Ghostbusters battle. The kind that bring real anger, real insecurity, real pain. Her sense of abandonment is vivid to me. Jason Reitman wisely didn't go with the bigger name here. He went with an outstanding actor that's finally getting her day in the sun. I've oft felt that Carrie Coon was an untapped talent, and I think she brings a lot of gravitas to the role. Yeah, I thought she was great. I think she's a super talented actress. It was an interesting character, and I think she did the most with what she was given. An interesting take on like the single mother character. So yeah, I liked her a lot. I know you didn't like her romantic scenes, but outside of that, how do you mm -hmm. feel about Carrie Coon? I thought she was great with the kids. She was a mother figure and I thought she was strong. It wasn't like she was like a completely warm person. She had dimension, so. I do want to talk to you about something that's close to your heart because I want to take a second to call out the score of this film. As our resident composer, I want to talk to you about it. Last year, one of my favorite scores was the very restrained, subtle score for a film called The Way Back, a basketball movie with Ben Affleck. It was one of my top 10 films of 2020. Here, composer Rob Simonson is back on a much bigger movie. And what I thought was brilliant about this score is he walked the tightrope of honoring Elmer Bernstein's original work while also making it modern and then adding music of his own that still fits within the world. It's a delicate balance, and I think it's an extraordinary challenge, extraordinary work in my mind. Because so much of it is derivative, it will likely be ineligible for Oscar consideration, but I still think it was a masterful achievement given the challenge of that. There's also a ton of it. It's rare to have this much score in movies nowadays, but Jason Reitman really leaned on Rob Simons in score. Patrick, you're our composer. What do you think? It's giving me that nostalgic Goonies adventure vibe. Well, it's giving and me the Ghostbusters vibe because it's a lot of the same notes, just played <laughs> differently. Because it's children as a protagonist, I got, I got into it as like an E.T., that kind of a thing. I love that kind of like fun adventure, almost bombastic when it gets to the scary parts on brand and fun. Calling out E.T. I think also has a lot to do with the direction because I do feel like E.T. was a direct inspiration for the chase scene that you love so much and a lot of the other choices, especially the reveals that Ryan talked about were very Spielbergian. The sense of off-screen space was very Spielbergian to me, I thought. That was what we talked about before. Going back to score, Ryan, 
Yeah, no, I think it had a very Amblin feel and it did everything it needed to do to establish that nostalgia. And it did it in such a way that wasn't heavy handed. It did it in a way that felt organic to the story. It did a lot for making you feel like you're watching a Ghostbusters movie. And I think that was the heavy burden was on the score and they did a wonderful job. Just so uh, the audience knows when he, when Ryan says Amblin, he's talking about the the company that Steven Spielberg founded with Frank Marshall and Kathleen Kennedy years ago. So Patrick, it's time for your favorite part of the show. What time is it? T -word. It's the T word. He's not calling a timeout. He's saying it's time for the T word where we talk about themes of the film. And yes, I do have a theme for Ghostbusters Afterlife. I was walking around a little bit after having drinks with Devin and Kelly and Patrick and his wife after the movie. And it occurred to me that this movie to me is about heritage and legacy. It's about how finding our ancestors can better help us find out about ourselves to further define our own identity and sense of self-worth. But also outside of the diegesis, the film honors the legacy and heritage of the creator of the franchise, Harold Ramis, in such a loving way, both graphically in the film and also by capturing the spirit of his vision overall. Add to that idea that it's the son of the director of the original taking a crack at the franchise completes that circle even further. It adds to that sense of immortality that sense of picking up where your ancestors left off just as in the movie and extending your family's heritage for the next generation. I feel like both in front and behind the camera, this movie is about heritage and legacy to me. I found it meaningful in that regard. Ryan. Yeah, I think the strongest parts of the movie are the parts that are, that are playing into that. I think there's a lot of parts in the movie that don't play into that. You know, I think for her finding her place in society, she was ostracized, didn't have friends and finds that there is something you know, no one could connect with her. Her parents didn't know what to do. And here she is finding, you know, essentially her lifelong calling that just comes so naturally to her. Thematically, it should have just focused on that and not had some scenes that just were in there for the sake of being in there. Patrick? Yeah, I think I think that is definitely a, a, a theme. I think to build on it, I think it, it's also about family and dealing with loss. And dealing with loss and not letting it darken your whole life because because questions aren't answered maybe maybe, maybe the answers will, will come later on i've got one more theme for you guys it's not as strong and it's sort of like an undercurrent very small in the film but it, it's one other thing that made me th the film made me think about even though the paranormal elements of the film are not real i think that there's a love and respect of science that permeates its way through the film most notably science and research as a tool for investigation and problem solving very often those into science are portrayed as nerds. And while Phoebe and Egon both share a certain lack of social skills, the efforts they both put into learning how things work pay great dividends when most needed. And at a time when getting kids interested in learning with all the distractions available to them, I think there's a certain noble reminder here, almost a call to arms for kids to think about how some elements of science can be interesting, exciting, or maybe even useful, whether you have to save the world or not. So I was thinking about science a little bit, Patrick. If they had the damn training sequence, so we understood the science. <laughs> we, we, they knew way too much about this car, like how to release the seat. I disagree. I, they knew... I feel like I feel like they, you know, like you they think it, discover it. They were pulling buttons and pushing levers that and then kid, discovering things. Now, now there was no scene where he pulled three buttons and then on the fourth one it worked. I don't remember that part. Like I see your point. I went along with it by a hair and i felt rewarded for it ryan anything on science in ghostbusters afterlife no i mean um i think it, that's a positive message that they kind of have in there and i think it hopefully will help you know inspire a new generation to to, to look up to characters like her and understand them more do you guys have closing thoughts yeah Patrick? i got a closing thought yeah um i think that this movie is a lot of fun go into this movie expecting to have fun and go in expecting to learn something deeper about Ghostbusters. See, that sound, his opening statement, his closing statement sound a hell of a lot more positive than everything <laughs> he said in the middle. So, but I like it because now he's back on board with me. F fun movies don't need, the, like there's going to be holes in fun movies. Just don't, don't worry about the hole. Don't be so hard on the movie because it's just really fun. Ryan, closing thoughts. The strongest parts of this movie when it is touching on something and trying to say something, but I think a lot of this movie was more focused on making you feel nostalgic than it was actually trying to say something. So I'm not necessarily hard on it. It's a fine time at the movies. He's used that word a lot, fine. Another thing we've talked about a lot tonight is we, we brought up Steven Spielberg a lot and it's fitting because we've reviewed no other director on the show more than Steven Spielberg. And we will add to that, if all goes well, we'll be back on Thursday, December 16th 
2021 to review his newest film, his version of West Side Story. And again, that's hopefully coming on Thursday, December 16th, 2021, if everybody's schedules line up. Our next show, however, is this upcoming Monday night, our Indie Spotlight, another movie from our my top 10 films of 2016, Captain Fantastic from director Matt Ross. And that's coming up this Monday, November 29th. In the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, happy Thanksgiving. Say happy Thanksgiving to the audience, everybody. Happy, happy Thanksgiving. Day. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for pinch hitting. Thank you, Patrick, for watching, coming to watch the movie with me, Patrick and Kelly. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, this meeting of the No Name Cinema Society is adjourned.